Hello everybody once again. I'm coming to you today from the CHCO television studios and I have something really cool to show you that I pulled out of our storage room. This is a Sony professional video monitor model PVM14M4 and it was made in 1998. It is a 14 inch unit and like my 8 inch Trinitron that I have at home, uh, you can't see it behind these labels, but this monitor has Sony's HR Trinitron tube, which was a very high resolution tube. And this monitor is capable of resolving 800 TV lines. For a 4x3 monitor, that equates to a full horizontal resolution of 1066 lines. So this monitor is almost capable of resolving a 1080i resolution picture. Now, unfortunately, unlike our other 14-inch PVM here, the PVM14L5, which is a PVM that can actually accept a 720p or 1080i signal through its component input, this monitor is straight standard definition. It can only handle 480i just like any other monitor of this type or television set or whatever. But this does have a tube with the very same specifications as our PVM14L5. So any signals that you put into this monitor, it's gonna look, or it should look, just as good as it would on a 14L5. It, the tube may actually be the same part number. I don't know. But first, a little bit of a background as to why this guy is here and where I am right now. Um, we're actually behind the studio right now. The studio is behind you. And we're in a little, basically, office that Patrick built for me. Well, anybody can use it, but I, I believe the inspiration for him doing it was to provide a space for me to do videotape digitization. Now, as you know, for the past two and a half years, I've been uh, digitizing our videotape archive. We have hundreds of videotapes, Umatic, VHS, Super VHS, Betacam, and I've gone through maybe a hundred tapes so far, so I'm going to be at this digitization project for the next several years at least, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that. And of course, I have done it at home. You guys have attended my live streams that I do, where we just sit and chill and watch uh, uh, old community television uh, content from these videotapes with many tape breakages and lots of mold and uh, sticky tapes and everything else along the way. But a while back, even before I moved to this town, I decided that maybe I wanted to bring the tape digitization here um, because at the time, of course, I lived half an hour away from here and carting boxes of tapes back and forth from home gets really tiring. And those boxes of tapes take up space. Now, even though I'm living locally to the station now, um, it still gets tiring carting boxes of tapes back and forth. And so why not bring the digitization back here to the station and do it right here? where all the tapes already are. Um, I mentioned this on social media once and a couple of people thought that that meant it was the end of the videotape digitization streams. No, it's not. They are going to continue, but it's going to happen here now, probably late at night like it always did, so I can be here alone and talk to you guys. Um, but yeah, since I wanted to bring the uh, digitization back here to the station. He built this little nook for me. Uh, if I can get out of the way here, which way should I go? He wheeled in this rack and put the VCRs that I need to use here. Here's the NEC phone system as well. Have not touched it since I made the first video of it. Well, I did work on it a bit. 
then I got stuck and, and just gave up. But I'm, I still plan to get this guy working and maybe make some more videos about it. But yeah, he brought in this cart, loaded the VCRs onto it. Um, I've got the iMac, our old iMac that used to be our editing system sitting here. And uh, I have this monitor here, which I obviously need uh, to aid in the videotape digitization. And then there's going to be some other equipment to make it happen as well. I'm not sure what that'll be yet, but I have a couple of options. So yeah, that's why this is here and I'm in here. And uh, I'm pretty excited to have this little space to uh, continue the tape digitization. In days gone by, we used this, but judging by the labels here, we use this as a, as a transmission monitor. But for as long as I've been here, it's just been in a storage unit. But I brought it up here from the storage room to use it with my videotape digitization work. And uh, I plugged it in and it seems to work just fine. Makes a great picture, sound is fine, uh, seems to be a perfectly good monitor. So let's take a look here. I mean, you've seen the front. It's got a tally light on there. So, uh, you know, back in the day, if you had studio cameras, the camera control units that would be in your control room would have uh, a tally output signal that you could wire into these monitors. And back before the days of multi-view displays, when you had to have a separate standalone monitor for every camera or every input on your video switcher, you could hook these tally lights up and they would light up when uh, you were on a particular camera. Likewise, the tally light on top of the camera itself would light up if you had it all wired up that way. On the front we see controls similar to what you've seen on the videos of my 8-inch PVM and, and my 5-inch PVM to a lesser extent. We've got our power button right there. Uh, this has a remote control capability, a wired remote, so it's got a light to show when uh, the wired remote is the one controlling. And we've got knobs for volume, contrast, phase, that's an NTSC thing, chroma, that's your color saturation, brightness, and aperture, which is basically your image sharpness. Unlike my PVMs at home, this has an on-screen display and it has an on-screen menu that you can navigate to set certain settings. And you've got buttons for usual PVM stuff. This thing has multiple inputs on it, which we'll see when we look at the back. It's got a dedicated degauss button, a blue only mode that you turn on to help set uh, your chroma and chroma phase and stuff, either on your proc amp or on the monitor itself under scan functionality, horizontal vertical delay which is useful if you're working with VCRs to check that the tape is being read correctly looking at the vertical interval and, and horizontal interval. And this does support 16 by 9 operation. In 1998 that was starting to become a thing so pretty cool. It just squishes down the picture. It's got external sync functionality and unlike all the other PVMs that I've seen, either my own or, or our 14L5, this has a front firing speaker, which is pretty cool. With the exception of the hump in the back, I don't think this is any longer than my 8 inch PVM or even my 5 inch PVM. Uh, obviously it was a priority to uh, make all the units as similar in length as possible to all be rack mount compatible. Looking at the back of the unit, we have a nice array of inputs. Starting from the left, we have an IEC connection for power. We've got a composite input that's uh, designated line A, a second composite input designated line B, an S-video input that's called line C, and then we have component input. Each input has its own audio input to go with it in the form of a mono coaxial input and all video and audio inputs have loop through outputs that you can run as well and of course it has external sync support there's the remote jack I'm not sure what you'd control with the remote 
date of manufacture December 1998, and it was made in Japan. To test the monitor, we're going to play what I believe is the first Umatic SP tape that I've come across in my tape digitization. A Sony KSP30 Umatic SP. Of course, Umatic SP was a, a, a quality improved version of Umatic, just like Betacam SP was to Betacam. Now, luckily, uh, unlike VHS and Super VHS, uh, Umatic SP is actually playback compatible in standard Umatic VCRs. Unfortunately, the only Umatic VCR available to me is a standard one, so I won't be able to digitize this tape with the uh, full Umatic SP quality, but we'll be able to digitize it nonetheless. The tape itself looks pretty cool too. Look at this, this chocolate brown color. Pretty cool. A Umatic SP cassette. This has some stuff on it recorded in 1991. So we'll take a look at that. This monitor produces really bright, really vibrant colors and it looks super crisp. Exactly as uh, I would expect from any PVM at this point. There's the underscan, the HV delay, useful for Umatic 16x9. The blue only mode, also useful for videotape work. Speaker gets plenty loud as well. This is CNFG TV channel 62. CNFG operates independently, delivering viewers a wide variety of programming from news and public affairs to locally produced family entertainment. We are licensed by the CRTC for Channel 62 in Ottawa. Our transmitter is located high atop Domes Hill. Our programming is also carried to repeater stations CNFG TV 2, Channel 14, Cornwall, CNFG TV 3, Channel 27, Portland, and CNFG TV Four, Channel 3, Room C29, Algonquin College. Our offices and studios are located at 1385 Woodruff Avenue South, Nepean, Ontario, K2G 1V8. We invite any comments concerning our programming. Now, sit back, relax, and enjoy Ottawa's only independent Channel 62 CNFG. Take a look at these scan lines. That's the metric by which people judge CRT TVs and monitors these days. And look at that, and of course that's a result of the very high resolution that these monitors are able to resolve both in horizontal and vertical directions. This thing, uh, this thing wasn't messing around, even though it's um, uh, not a high definition capable unit. It had some serious resolution uh, with that HR Trinitron tube, which I suspect is the same tube used in the very revered PVM 14L5. Well guys, that's all there is to show of the Sony Professional Video Monitor model PVM 14M4. What a nice monitor indeed. I'm, needless to say, I'm really happy that I saw this in the storage room and drug it back up after it was drugged down from here however many years ago. That's a great monitor. It's got some serious image quality with that HR Trinitron tube. 
Uh, it's got all the inputs that I'm going to need. This is going to be a great monitor for my tape digitization. 14 inches is a good size. It's got all the hookups I need. And it's got some serious image quality with that HR Trinitron tube. Really, really impressive. So I hope you guys enjoyed looking at this uh, old monitor. Still working great and that makes me really happy. So thank you very much for watching. I'm going to leave you today with some video I recorded while we were driving through Ottawa, Ontario. There was about eight of us in a minivan. This tour in the dark of night was actually the only time we saw Ottawa. We flew to Ottawa, but we actually stayed in a village in Quebec about 20 minutes away. Uh, but it was still really cool and I might as well have been a child seeing a city for the first time because it was amazing. For context, the biggest city I've seen in the last 15 years is St. John, New Brunswick, which is 1 15th the size of Ottawa. This is also the most far west I've ever traveled and the farthest from home I've ever traveled, which beats out a school trip to Boston, Massachusetts I took in 2007. So enjoy this crappy footage taken by the 10-year-old phone I was using at the time. I should. I have not got around to the link. The Spark Street was a pedestrian mall we just passed. My mom writes in her diary when she was 16 at the end of the Second World War, everybody was dumping... Um, it seemed like, like it was like you're shooting off into space. That's what you did, yeah. <laughs> shooting off into space. Well, this is the most exciting thing I've ever It done. was. Did you guys get to go above the clouds? Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. Actually, of course, it was overcast when we landed, but we were above the cast. Oh, so so I guess so you didn't really get to see too much then coming across, though? Like, oh, the when we took off, you could see a bit for probably 20 minutes or so. Oh. Or at least it, or for a, originally nobody could, and then it was within four blocks or something, so it's still a pretty kind of short downtown core. amazing gothic parliament buildings that was yeah, really towering over the city you know when it was built here so yeah, can you tell us about the peace tower why it's called about the what the peace tower uh what what would you like to know about it like what why uh, why is it called the peace tower yeah. i don't know but they they do a different flag up there every day and they give the flag as presents to visiting <coughs> dignitaries the ones that have flown on the peace tower it was originally not so tall. The original Peace Tower burned down in 1916, and then they, they built it back taller. This one says I can't go left either, so I'm going to do an illegal left turn, and we're never going to get where we're going. That might upset Jeff. I guess I maybe shouldn't, because he's falling. Is he? <laughs> I don't know where he's supposed to be. I don't see him. He, had, he knows where I'm going, though. Hussein's got GPS. He's got my address, so. So we're, we're running parallel to Wellington now. I'm just trying to figure out if we can get back and see it. So that's part of the parliament, right in, in the middle. Yeah, so I can't, we can't go left, but you'll see, you'll see it. There it is. Yeah. So it's kind of got the middle, the center block, and then the west block is the chunk on the left, and the, the east block is there. And I don't know if you know that they're refurbishing parliament right now. Um, Parliament doesn't actually sit. The Chambers of Chamber of Commerce is empty. They're sitting in like the Museum of History in, yeah. in another building right now. So I'll just show you a couple more things that you may recognize from TV. So on the left over there, you know the CPR hotels, like the one. Yes. So that's the Ottawa one. So in the old days, the building on the right with all the pillars was Ottawa's train station, and the trains would come right into the middle, and you could train across the country, and then you walk across the street and stay in this big fantasy you know, Princess Castle Hotel, just like the one in Winnipeg and yeah. the Royal York in Toronto and so on. 